Okay, so today's video is going to be about neoplasia and cancer. So neoplasia is a disorder of altered cell differentiation and growth. And when we talk about cancer, this is actually the loss of the cell's ability to control or go through their cell cycle normally. And so you know the cell cycle has to do with how cells um, not only divide, but how they grow on a daily basis. And most cells, um, they're growing more often than they are dividing. So this affects cells especially that are rapidly dividing. So that would be like, for instance, hair cells or uh, cells in your small intestine that help to make up villi. Those are some examples of cells that rapidly divide that can be really affected by this. And then cells lose their ability to differentiate. So what happens is once they don't go through this cell cycle appropriately, they can't actually do what they're supposed to do. So if you remember, you have cells that are undifferentiated and then you have cells that are differentiated. And typically we call undifferentiated cells stem cells. And these cells are cells that haven't yet figured out what kind of cell they're going to be. So they're not really doing much in the body. They're just waiting to become, let's say, a bone cell, or they're waiting to become uh, a cell for the heart. Once they become that kind of cell, then we say that, that the cell is differentiated. But a cell that cannot go through the cell cycle appropriately loses its ability to be differentiated. And so cancer officially is a disease that is resulting from the loss of cell cycle regulation and then cell proliferation. So cancer is a big problem in the U.S. I mean, it's a big problem around the world. And about one and a half million people are diagnosed with cancer every year. And about a third of those people die every year. So almost 560,000 people die from different types of cancers in the U.S., for men, the most common cancer is prostate cancer, and for women, the most common cancer is breast cancer. Now, this does not include skin cancers, and that's because some skin cancers are what we would call in situ. So that means you can get skin cancers, um, but they haven't gone through the basement membrane, and that means they're not spreading throughout the body. Lung cancer is the leading cause of death for both men and women. So prostate and breast cancer are the most common forms of cancer, but lung cancer is the leading cause of death. So these show you uh, estimated new cases per year and then estimated deaths. So you can see prostate and breast cancer are number one, lung cancer being number two, and then colon and rectal cancer being right under that as number three, but the most people are going to die from lung cancer. Although, I have to say that the number of colon and rectal cancer cases are going up in the United States, especially around, uh, among young people, which means people under the age of 40. So when we think about cancer, a lot of times people think, oh, a tumor and cancer are basically the same thing. So we need to talk about tumor. And these are cells that lose what we call contact inhibition. So what that means is that cells are supposed to be able to grow next to each other, grow on top of each other in a very distinct fashion. So if you remember, you have simple layers of cells or simple layer of cell, and then you have a stratified layer, which is multiple layers of cells. And so what will happen is these cells start to grow inappropriately, and sometimes these cells also lose the ability to stay together with other cells. So they're tight junctions that are made out of proteins that kind of weave or sew cells together. Uh, they break because these cells, uh, a lot of times, because they can't divide, they can't go through mitosis, these cells start to get bigger and they can get so big and so heavy that as they're moving, they break those tight junctions and then there's a possibility of them uh, eventually floating away as well. So now because the cells aren't growing and uh, sitting next to each other in a unified way, 
they start kind of growing willy-nilly around each other and on top of each other, and they form this mass or what is referred to as a tumor. So a tumor is just simply an abnormal mass of cells. And then your tumor can be benign or it can be malignant. Now, when we're talking about a benign tumor, this is not something that would typically be uh, called cancerous. And that's because even though this is an unusual mass of cells, usually benign tumors don't create problems in the human body. And that's because benign tumors have a connective tissue bubble, you might say, around them. They're surrounded with this connective tissue and they stay where they're at. Now, one of the problems, however, with a benign tumor is depending on where they're located in the body, uh, this can be an issue because this mass can press on certain things. So for instance, you might have a benign tumor in the pituitary gland. So this is a picture of, you can see a pituitary tumor here. And so the issue is that this pituitary tumor is, although it's benign, it's very large and it's pressing on the pituitary as well as other regions of the brain. And when something like that happens, then you can have secondary issues because of this tumor. Now, the other thing about tumors, they can also be what we call malignant, and that means that they have the ability to metastasize. And so this is typically what we would refer to as a cancerous type of cell. It can spread when it metastasizes, it spreads throughout the body. So a couple definitions again, benign, not capable of metastasizing, you typically not capable of causing death, malignant tumors able to metastasize and to spread throughout the body, and then neoplasm, that's an uncontrolled uh, death, excuse me, not uncontrolled death, uncontrolled growth of cells, and that can be benign or malignant, and then a tumor is that mass. Okay. Usually, when somebody does talk about a tumor, they're talking about a neoplasm. So, cancer is any type of malignant neoplasm or malignant tumor capable of metastasizing. And so, a benign tumor would not, in the scientific realm, be considered cancer because it's not able to metastasize. It would be called a benign tumor. But a malignant tumor would then be called cancer. So different types of cancers have different types of names. So for instance, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but just uh, carcinomas would be a malignant neoplasm of epithelial cells, whereas a sarcoma would be a malignant neoplasm of mesenchymal cells. So let's talk about those just for a second. So you have, when you have this little tiny fetus that's developing, uh, it's going from having this, and actually we talk about embryo first, that embryo is going from this ball of cells. And that ball of cells are all undifferentiated cells. And eventually those cells will differentiate, they'll turn into things. And there are basically three major layers that that embryo is going to start turning into in order to become that fetus that looks like a human being. So you have what's called the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And when you talk about the endoderm, these cells on the interior of that ball of cells, these cells are going to turn into like lung cells, gut cells, uh, muscle cells. The mesoderm, which is the middle layer of cells, they're turning into bone, fat, cartilage, connective tissue. And then the outer ectoderm is turning into epithelial cells and our neurological system. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of the layers of cells. And the reason that we care about that is it has a lot to do with how cancer is named. So more definitions. When you see OMA, like a carcinoma or a sarcoma, that is used typically. Now, not always, okay? So there's, an, until sometimes scientists at first, they don't get their definitions and their naming right. So mainly an OMA now is used for a benign tumor, okay? And uh, then there's a matching type of variety for a malignant tumor, okay?
So for instance, an adenoma, this is um, a tumor of a gland. Okay, so oma means swelling, adene means a gland. So a adenoma is a swelling of a gland or that tumor. So this is a benign tumor of the fibrous tissue is a fibroma. That's another example. Now malignant tumors uh, are named typically again by adding carcinoma. Okay, so oma for benign, carcinoma for malignant. Okay, so this is the malignant tumors and they are usually the carcinomas are epithelial in origin. Okay, so when we talk about that epithelial, so that's uh, breast tissue, prostate, bronchial tissue, those are all carcinomas, okay? Uh, and then skin also, okay? So you could have what's called like uh, a carcinoma in situ, and that's just cancer in the top layers of the skin. A sarcoma, if the tumor is from the mesenchymal or the uh, middle layer of cells, and that's bone, cartilage, fat, muscle, that type of thing. And then adenocarcinoma, so adeno, remember, that has to do with the glands, okay? And then carcinoma, epithelial tissue. So this is, adenocarcinoma is a tumor of glandular epithelial cells. Okay, so a fibrosarcoma is if the tumor is of the fibrous connective tissue in the mesenchymal layer. Okay, so mutations are the cause of cancer. This is due to damage to the DNA, which we would call mutant DNA. And this is because, again, that cell cycle isn't working appropriately. There's certain things that go wrong in that cell cycle that create these mutations, okay? So your cell cycle, this is a very particular step-by-step process where the cell is not only dividing but all of the information inside the cell has to divide and sometimes you know the interesting thing is when we talk about mitosis of a cell we really focus on the nucleus of the cell and the DNA dividing which is important but you also have to remember everything else inside the cell has to divide too so organelles have to divide and so on and what's happening is you are making two genetically identical daughter cells is called the cell cycle this cycle is divided into phases based on what is happening in the cell at a given time a cell grows during the g1 phase during this phase there is a chemical checkpoint that controls whether the cell will divide delay division or enter a resting stage when conditions in the cell are right the g1 checkpoint will be passed and the cell will enter the synthesis s phase during the S phase, DNA replication occurs so that future cells will each have a complete set of the genetic instructions in the DNA. After DNA replication is complete, cells enter the G2 phase, where they continue to grow and prepare for cell division. At a checkpoint in this phase, the success of DNA replication is assessed. If all is well, the cell enters the mitosis, M phase. During the M phase, a complex series of events moves the DNA so that a complete set of genetic instructions will be sent to each daughter cell. The process of mitosis is assessed at a checkpoint during the M phase. Once this checkpoint is passed, the cell will complete mitosis as well as begin the cytokinesis C phase. Part or all of the C phase actually overlaps with the later parts of mitosis, so it is not a distinctly separate phase. During the C phase, the cytoplasm of the cell is divided, and two daughter cells are created from the original cell. When this process is finished, the daughter cells enter the G1 phase, and the cycle is complete. Okay, so let's talk about the cell cycle in particular. We'll start out with interphase. Now, you know that you have interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase as part of the cell cycle. Interphase is the part of the cell cycle where the cell spends most of its time. So this is a growth phase as well as a duplication phase for the cell. 
So you have the first part of interphase, which is called the G1 portion or the G1 phase, and G stands for gap. So this is the gap one phase, and it begins from the end of uh, cytokinesis. The cell has just divided, and uh, it continues until the S phase where DNA synthesis is going to take place. So of course this is the first gap phase. And the cell grows physically larger during this time. So I don't know if you remember, we talked in physio about endocytosis and exocytosis. So cells actually, when they go through endocytosis, with endocytosis, they're bringing things into the cell. And when they do, parts of the cell membrane actually pinch off. And so what that does is, as the cell membrane pinches off, it makes the cell become smaller. Now, when the cell goes through exocytosis, things are leaving the cell, and cell membrane uh, from that vesicle that the uh, proteins or whatever it is is exiting the cell, that vesicle attaches to the cell membrane and now the cell becomes larger. So a cell actually goes through exocytosis more often than endocytosis. So the cells are getting bigger. And typically what will happen in a healthy cell is that when the cell gets to a certain size, a certain big size, the DNA is signaled to say, hey, we need to start going through the division type of thing going on. So we're going to start duplicating DNA and all that stuff. So first, before DNA duplication occurs, we're going to copy organelles. We need to duplicate those. And we need to make any other extra building blocks that we'll need to help for this division to occur. So maybe more enzymes or more ATP, whatever it may be. So then the S phase occurs, which is S for synthesis, and this is DNA synthesis where we're going to duplicate the number of strands of DNA. We're also going to duplicate the centrosomes. So if you remember, the centrosomes, they are going to help to separate the DNA, and what they do is they're going to, oops, sorry, they're going to produce microtubules that go through the whole cell and once the DNA is duplicated, uh, eventually, during the mitosis phases, uh, DNA is going to hook onto those microtubules, and the centrosomes are going to hold those microtubules, and then they pull, and the whole idea is they pull the two sides uh, of the cell, or the two cells, I should say, apart and separate for cytokinesis. So G2, or GAP2, the second GAP phase, uh, the cells continue to grow more because this is still interphase. We're making more proteins. We're continuing to produce the organelles so that division can occur. And then we're going to start organizing everything so that uh, things are moving towards different sides of the cell. So when division occurs, everything is equally separated. So the gap between DNA synthesis and mitosis uh, is all about cellular growth still. So the cell, even though it's starting to duplicate things like organelles, it's still doing its typical functions, endocytosis, exocytosis, all that kind of good stuff, and it's sending those things uh, out to the body. So now, during this phase also, there's a way to assess, as the DNA replication is occurring, whether there's any mutations or errors, and we're going to talk about those also, how those assessments occur. So this is just showing you all of interphase. So we start at G1, cell growth, and then we have the S phase, DNA synthesis, and then the second gap phase where cell growth continues. And mitosis, the actual separation to form the two daughter cells, is a very short portion of the cell cycle. So the M phase is the mitotic phase, and this is where the DNA starts to do what we call condense. So inside of our cells, inside the nucleus, we have these little round balls of protein called histones. And if you can imagine this kind of being like a ball of yarn and how you wrap the yarn around that ball, that's what's happening to our DNA. The DNA is like the yarn and it's wrapping and wrapping around these histones and it's starting to compact or condense. And as it condenses, you can actually see the DNA under a microscope.
So then the DNA is pulled apart by those mitotic spindles, those microtubules that I told you about that the centrosomes make. And the cytoplasm is divided into the two daughter cells by that cytokinesis. So again, those phases of actual mitosis or the M phase, that's going to be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, okay? And if you want to look at this YouTube video a little bit later, it's going through the whole process of mitosis step by step. We're just not going to look at it right now. So again, this is just a picture showing you this is the interphase, and interphase is happening uh, as the longest phase. Then you go to prophase. Metaphase is where all that DNA lines up together. And then anaphase, those microtubules are starting to, or mitotic spindles, whatever you want to call them, are starting to pull the DNA into opposite sides of the cell where the centrosomes are. And then telophase is where you see the cleavage furrow and the two cells are starting to divide going into cytokinesis. All right. So this is going to talk about the process of stimulating the DNA so that cellular division can occur. Replication of animal cells usually occurs only when specific growth factors are present. There are many types of growth factors that can be produced in a body to stimulate cell division. Okay, so the first thing that's happening here is you have some kind of growth factor. Now, if you remember, we used the word factor before in um, physio, and what we talked about was that growth factor, the word factor means... Uh, we know this chemical exists, we just don't know what its chemical structure is. And this right here is representing the receptor in the cell membrane that this growth factor is going to bind to, and then it's going to stimulate a process within the cell. If the right growth factor is present for a given cell type, <laughs> it will match up precisely with a specific cell surface receptor and bind to it. The binding of a growth factor to a receptor starts production of signals within the cell. Typically, this within-cell signaling system is a protein kinase cascade. Now remember, any time phosphate is going to bind to a protein, it's going to change the structure of that protein. And what's happening here is this is going to be an enzyme, and when the phosphate or phosphorylation occurs, it's going to phosphate what we call regulatory proteins, or proteins that are going to regulate certain processes in the body. And we'll talk about this protein kinase cascade in a little bit. A series of reactions where phosphate groups are passed along to different regulatory proteins in the cell. Ultimately, the cascade ends with phosphorylated proteins entering the nucleus and interacting with regulatory proteins there. Now notice, let me go back just a little bit. There are two proteins here, and we're going to talk about these pr two proteins in a little bit. Uh, so I want you to remember these two, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss what they're all about. There. The typical result is that some specific proteins are freed to activate genes for cyclins and cyclin-dependent protein kinases, CDK. Okay. So, again, these proteins are going to be very important, and I want you to remember the word cyclin and cyclin-dependent protein kinases or just cyclin-dependent kinases, okay? And they're really responsible for helping to stimulate the cell dividing. The cyclin and CDK proteins then act to stimulate cell division. Okay. All right, so again, you have interface, and so G1, S, G2, and M. And we're going to talk about these checkpoints, okay? So these checkpoints at the G1S interphase and at the G2M interphase, and then there's another checkpoint at the M interphase, those are all checkpoints that are going to allow us to know whether um, the DNA is appropriate, okay, or whether it's able to uh, continue on if the cell should be allowed to divide or not. And if there's something mutated in that DNA, then the cell is going to do different things to prevent, hopefully, prevent division from occurring. 
Okay, so again, cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, these are two regulatory proteins, and what they're regulating is cells going through this cellular division. Okay? So cyclins are just simply proteins, okay? And they can control the entry as well as the progression of a cell going through its cell cycle. So cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, which are the enzyme portion of this, okay, these are going to bond together and allow phosphorylation of different proteins to happen. And you have to have this phosphorylation for the um, cell cycle to actually be able to occur. So what happens is you have phosphorylation of these regulatory proteins and then these proteins from the cytoplasm enter into the nucleus, okay? And that phosphate can then activate the regulatory proteins like cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases in order to trigger cell division. So there's also what's called a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. And this is going to... Uh, occur at particular checkpoints to prevent DNA replication mistakes. Okay, so progression one, excuse me, for progression from, there we go, one phase of the cell cycle to the next needs to be orderly, okay, and those CDKs are going to control this orderly progression. So cyclin proteins, again, they're going to bind to the enzyme, the CDK, the cyclin-dependent kinase, and that causes phosphorylation and activation of other regulatory proteins, which will then trigger cell division to occur, and in particular, trigger the DNA, and when the DNA is triggered, the DNA makes certain proteins that tell the cell, hey, it's time. We need to go through division. So one more video. During the first phase of the cell cycle, G1, there is a chemical checkpoint that a cell must pass to begin the process that leads to cell division. The protein products of several tumor suppressor genes act at that checkpoint to control cell division. Cells with mutated forms of the tumor suppressor genes may not be able to stop the cell cycle at the G1 checkpoint, thus allowing them to grow and divide rapidly and form a tumor. One such tumor suppressor gene is the retinoblastoma, RB gene. It is okay, so before it goes on, so this RB gene is an example, and there are several types of tumor suppressor genes We'll talk about P53, and then there's another one called tumor necrosis factor. And basically what these are doing is these are suppressing or stopping the ability of the cell to go past the checkpoint because something is wrong, okay? That's what the retinoblastoma protein is all about. So you have a retinoblastoma gene in your DNA, and that allows the cell to produce the retinoblastoma protein, which then can physically suppress the actions of the cell cycle. It is often found to be mutated in a form of cancer in the eye called retinoblastoma. As okay, so again, the issue for people is retinoblastoma, let's say, uh, this individual has a uh, mutated gene, okay? So maybe something has happened, they got it from their parents, so it's genetic, or maybe they actually didn't even get this gene from their parents. Or, for instance, there is a gene, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, called the P53 gene, and that is a really important gene to help us in suppressing mutated cells. And... It is a tumor suppressor gene. Some people will be born 
without a p53 gene now remember you're going to get one of those p53 genes from mom and you're going to get one of those p53 genes from dad but if mom doesn't have that gene to pass along to baby and dad doesn't have the gene to pass along to baby now baby cannot make that p53 protein and so the person cannot stop the mutation from occurring in their own body and people who don't have even one copy of the p53 gene are very prone to cancers at a super duper young age same thing with the retinoblastoma gene if i don't have one copy or my gene is wrong i can't suppress a certain type of cancer in the eye which we call a retinoblastoma cancer remember the oma thing right well as in many other cancers. Normally, the RB protein will bind to a transcription factor called E2F. Transcription factors are proteins that can activate gene expression. The G1 checkpoint is passed when special cell cycle proteins cyclin and CDK work together to free E2F from RB. The released transcription factor then activates genes that start the cell on the path to cell division. Mutated forms of RB may not bind to E2F, allowing E2F to act without control to promote cell division. Okay, so long story short here, E2F, okay, if it's left all by itself, okay, E2F is what triggers cell division. So you need this protein to bind to E2F to stop cell division from occurring. So if this protein is mutated and it cannot bind to this E2F or this uh, promoter, you might say, then you're going to have uncontrolled cell division, which is uncontrolled cellular growth, which is what we call cancer. Another tumor suppressor protein that works at the G1 checkpoint is P53. This protein checks for damaged DNA, acting as a quality control for the cell. If damage is detected, then P53 both activates a DNA repair system and halts the cell cycle at the G1 checkpoint until the damage is repaired. The halt is accomplished by turning on the gene for another protein, P21, that keeps cyclin and CDK from interacting. As long as cyclin and CDK cannot form a complex, the cell cannot pass through the G1 checkpoint. The P53 gene is found to be mutated in a wide variety of cancers. In these cases, P53 fails to turn on P21 and thus does not halt the cell cycle like it should when DNA is damaged. The other thing that we know that P53 can do is it can stimulate apoptosis of the cell. And so you know apoptosis is where that cell actually destroys itself and it goes through that cellular suicide. So all cells contain genes that function as, like we just looked at, that tumor suppressor thing, stop, don't grow anymore, and then the E2F and the cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinases are kind of the go type of control. So we call the go genes proto-oncogenes, and they produce go proteins, and they promote or they stimulate cell division. Oncogenes are cancer genes. So these come from mutations of the proto-oncogenes, okay? And their function is basically to allow uncontrolled cellular growth to occur. So let's say that you actually do have the P53 genes, okay? You're not missing those genes, but they're mutated. And they can't stop the cell division. So those would be called oncogenes because they allow uncontrolled cellular growth. So the tumor suppressor genes, like we talked about, those are the stop genes, okay? And they are opposite of proto-oncogenes. And they produce these proteins like the retinoblastoma that will inhibit cell division, or the P53. And mutations of these tumor suppressor genes leave cell growth uninhibited. All right, so here's one more video. How is growth of cells controlled? 
Each growing cell binds minute amounts of positive regulatory proteins called growth factors that stimulate cell division. A specific cell surface receptor recognizes each growth factor, its shape fitting that growth factor precisely. Growth factors work by triggering intracellular signaling systems. Binding of a growth factor sets in motion a cascading intracellular signaling pathway, usually involving phosphorylation of proteins, which activates nuclear regulatory proteins that trigger cell division. For example, the retinoblastoma protein, RB, is a molecule that interacts with many key regulatory proteins of the cell cycle, depending on its state of phosphorylation. When RB is dephosphorylated, it binds to and ties up regulatory proteins such as MYC, which is a protein needed for cell proliferation. When phosphorylated, the RB protein releases its captive regulatory protein, freeing it to act and thus promote cell division. Free of RB inhibition, cells begin to produce cyclin-dependent protein kinases, CDK, and cyclins, and proceed through cell division. And of course, you can watch these videos again if you'd like later on. They're in your PowerPoint. So the retinoblastoma gene, we've talked about this, is actually a pretty rare cancer. Uh, or retinoblastoma is a pretty rare cancer in children. Uh, and their retinoblastoma gene is inactive. So that tumor suppressor gene is not working. And typically what retinoblastoma proteins do is they prevent cell division. So, for instance, binding to that MYC protein uh, will keep the MYC protein from stimulating the DNA to make cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases, which are necessary to trigger cellular division. So the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein, uh, phosphorylation of that protein causes progression of the cell into the S phase. And so if there's something wrong with that protein, then uh, you may go directly into the S phase and you can't stop at the checkpoint. P53, this is found on the P arm or the small arm of chromosome 17. It's a protein that is made in virtually every normal tissue, every normal cell, and it controls, of course, the P53 protein levels. And the P53 proteins increase with damage to the DNA. So one of the things they do, like in that video, it tells you that it reads the damaged DNA and then it signals different enzymes in our nucleus to come in and fix that DNA. Or it can initiate apoptosis of the damaged DNA. And uh, P53 is so important, it's been called the guardian of the genome because it restricts uncontrolled cellular growth. You don't have P53, you're in trouble. I have a sister-in-law who died a few years ago, and she died of brain cancer. Now, she did not have any P53 genes. She didn't get it from dad, she didn't get it from mom, and her grandparents died early from cancer. Her mom died very young from cancer. Her dad died soon after that from cancer. Her sister died from cancer. Uh, interesting thing with my sister-in-law, she actually got cancer when she was 15. It was a type of brain cancer and uh, she had an oligodendroglioma and that uh, is actually a very slow spreading type of brain cancer, so she was able to live until she was about 45, but it was definitely because she didn't have any P53 proteins to restrict this uncontrolled cellular pro proliferation. So P53 gene is deleted or mutated in about 70 to 80 percent of the cases in colorectal, breast cancer, uh, lung cancers, liver cancers. Uh, brain cancer, so numerous different types of tumors are because of this P53, or lack thereof. So you have a proto-oncogene, and this is your good gene, but some kind of mutation occurs, and it becomes an oncogene.
those mutated proteins are being produced and what they do is they cause excessive stimulation of the uh, protein kinases and the cyclins and the cell cycle goes too quickly and you have uncontrolled growth. If you don't have the tumor suppressor genes, the whole idea is they're supposed to hit at this checkpoint, decrease cell proliferation. Now, epigenetics. Epigenetics, um, they're kind of an interesting thing. This is where we can change how proteins are produced by our DNA uh, and this is all dependent on environment. So it has to do, first of all, not only with what you do to your body, but it also has to do with, most likely, what your mother did while she was pregnant with you and what your grandmother did while she was pregnant with your mom. So a lot of times there are certain genes that should be turned on and there are certain genes that should not be turned on. And with epigenetics, when we're looking at cancers, this involves uh, changes of gene expression, and, but there's no real change in the DNA. There's no mutation. So some genes that should have been silent genes turn on and other genes turn off. So for instance, if I have totally normal DNA, uh, I may be eating certain foods or doing certain things that silence or turn off the genes that produce my tumor suppressor proteins. Now, usually what happens is this is what we call methylation. Now, methylation is literally where methyl groups attach to your DNA, and a methyl group is a carbon and three hydrogens. And those methyl groups will attach to the DNA and they change the expression of the DNA, which genes are on, which genes are off. And again, this can be inherited by your mom or your grandma, depending on what they ate, and it can also happen to you. Now, the other interesting thing is that uh, you can turn on and turn off um, important genes by the way you eat. And so what scientists have found is the more methyl groups you consume, the more good genes are turned on and the less bad genes are turned off. So what do I find, what kind of foods do I find methyl groups in? And those are deep green leafy vegetables mainly, your good things. The things that prevent methylation would be the bad stuff we eat like too much sugar and too many carbs, so yeah. You ever notice that if you get to know two identical twins, they might look alike, but they're always subtly different? Yeah, whatever. As they get older, those differences can get more pronounced. Two people start out the same, but their appearance and their health can diverge. For instance, you have more gray hair. No, no, I don't. Identical twins have the same DNA, the exact same genes. Yeah. And don't our genes make us who we are? Well, they do, yes, but they're not the whole story. Some researchers have discovered a new bit of biology that can work with our genes or against them. Yeah. You're heavier and I'm better looking. Yeah, whatever. Imagine coming into the world with a person so like yourself that for a time you don't understand mirrors. As a child, when I looked in the mirror, I'd say, that's my sister. And my mother would say, no, that's your reflection. And even if you resist this cookie-cutter existence, cultivate individual styles and abilities, like cutting your hair differently or running faster. Uncanny similarities bond you together. Facial expressions body language, the way you laugh, or dress for an interview perhaps, when you hadn't a clue what your sister was going to wear. The synchrony in your lives constantly confronts you. When I see my sister, I see myself. 
If she looks good, I think I look pretty today. But if she's not wearing makeup, I say, my God, I look horrible. It's hardly surprising because you both come from the same egg. You have precisely the same genes. And you're literally clones. Better known as identical twins. But now, imagine this. One day, your twin, your clone, is diagnosed with cancer. Por favor. If you're the other twin, what can you do except wait for the symptoms? Yo sé que... I have been told that I am a high risk for cancer. Damocles sword hangs over me. And yet, it's not uncommon for a twin like Anna Marie to get a dread disease, while the other, like Clotilde, doesn't. But how can two people so alike be so unalike? Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's, despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jurdle. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny ones? That's correct. Because these are huge. They're huge. Uh, can we weigh them to find sure. out? So if you take... This is Looks like they can barely walk. They, they didn't, can't walk too much. They're not going to be running very far. So that's so about 63 grams? 63 grams. Let's look at the other one. So it's half the weight. Right. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti. But in the yellow mouse, it stays on all the time, causing obesity. <laughs> Just look at this. So what accounts for the thin mouse? Exercise? Atkins? No. A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen, called a methyl group, has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome, the epigenome. Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. In fact, it's the epigenome that tells our cells what sort of cells they should be. Skin, hair, heart, you see, all these cells have the same genes, but their epigenomes silence the unneeded ones to make cells different from one another. Epigenetic instructions pass on as cells divide, but they're not necessarily permanent. Researchers think they can change, especially during critical periods like puberty or pregnancy. Jurdle's mice reveal how the epigenome can be altered. To produce thin brown mice instead of fat yellow ones, he feeds pregnant mothers a diet rich in methyl groups to form the tags that can turn genes off. And I think you can see that we dramatically shifted the coat color and we get many, many more brown animals. And that matters because your coat color is a tracer. It's, it's an indicator That's correct. of the the fact that you have turned off that gene. That's right. This epigenetic fix was also inherited by the next generation of mice, regardless of what their mothers ate. And when an environmental toxin was added to the diet instead of nutrients, more yellow babies were born, doomed to grow fat and sick like their mothers. <laughs> 
it seems to me this has profound implications for our health. It does. For human health, if there are genes like this in humans, basically what you eat can affect your For human health, if there are genes like this in humans, basically what you eat can affect your future generations. So you're not only what you eat, potentially what your mother ate, and possibly even... For human health, if there are genes like this in humans, basically what you eat can affect your future generations. So you're not only what you eat, potentially what your mother ate, and possibly even what your grandparents ate. So how do you go to humans to do this experiment when you have these mice and they're genetically identical on purpose? That's so right. So who is your perfect lab human? Well, then we look for identical humans, which are identical twins. 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 And that brings us to the reason why we're showing you Spanish twins. In 2005, they participated in a groundbreaking study in Madrid. Its aim? To show just how identical, epigenetically, they are or aren't. One of the questions of twins is that if my twin has this disease, I will have the same disease. And genetics uh, tell us that there is a high risk of developing the same disease, but it's not really uh, sure they're going to have it, because our genes are just part of the story. Something has to regulate these genes. And part of the explanation is epigenetics. Estella wanted to see if the twins' epigenomes might account for their differences. To find out, he and his team collected cells from 40 pairs of identical twins, age 3 to 74. Then began the laborious process of dissolving the cells until all that was left were wispy strands of DNA, the master molecule that contains our genes. Next, researchers amplified fragments of the DNA until the genes themselves became detectable. Those that had been turned off epigenetically appear as dark pink bands on the gel. Now, notice what happens when the genes from a pair of twins are cut out and overlapped. The results are far from subtle, especially when you compare the epigenomes of two sets of twins that differ in age. Here on the left is the overlapped DNA of six-year-old Javier and Carlos. The yellow indicates where their gene expression is identical. On the right is the DNA of 66-year-old Ana Marie and Clotilde. In contrast to the younger twins, hardly any yellow shines through. Their epigenomes have changed dramatically. The study suggests that as twins age, epigenetic differences accumulate, especially when their lifestyles differ. One of the main findings of research is that epigenomes can change in function of what we eat, of what we smoke, of what we drink. And this is one of the key uh, differences between epigenetics and genetics. As the chemical tags that control our genes change, cells can become abnormal, triggering diseases like cancer. Take a disorder like MDS cancer of the blood and bone marrow. It's not a diagnosis you'd ever want to hear. When I went in and he started patting my hand and he was going, your blood work does not look very good at all and that I had um, MDS leukemia and uh, that there was not a cure for it and basically I had six months uh, to live. Was epigenetics the reason? Could the silencing of critical genes turn normal cells into cancerous ones? It's scary to think that a few misplaced tags can kill you. But it's also good news 
because we've traditionally viewed cancer as a disease stemming solely from broken genes. And it's a lot harder to fix damaged genes than to rearrange epigenetic tags. In fact, we already have a few drugs that will work. Recently, Sandra Shelby and Roy Cantwell participated in one of the first clinical trials using epigenetic therapy. The idea of epigenetic therapy is to stay away from killing the cell. Rather, what we are trying to do is diplomacy, trying to change the instructions of the cancer cells, reminding the cell, hey, you're a human cell, you shouldn't be behaving this way. And we try to do that by reactivating genes. The results have been incredible. And I didn't have really any horrible side effects. I am in remission. And going in the plus direction is a whole lot better than the minus direction. In fact, half the patients in the trial are now in remission. But while it may be easier to fix our epigenome than our genome, messing it up is easier too. We've got to get people thinking more about what they do. They have a responsibility for their epigenome. Their genome they inherit, but their epigenome they potentially can alter, and particularly that of their children. And that brings in responsibility, but it also brings in hope. You're not necessarily stuck with this. You can alter this.